Tibet House member video. Originally recorded during the Force for Good class series in January 2016 with Sharon Salzberg and friends. That's nice, but uh, think about connection. Because one other mistake we make is that we define loving kindness as a certain narrow band of feeling. It's a certain, in our minds, it's a certain emotional reaction. It may not be emotional at all. You might just look at somebody and find yourself in them or recognize they're really struggling, but you're not having some huge emotional response. Or it's a sense of inclusion rather than discounting. Um, those moments when you think you know all about somebody just based on assumption. And then something happens to threaten that superstructure of assumption. And you feel like, oh, now I really see them you know, much more truthfully. Um, I used to, I still teach in Washington, D.C. fairly often. And um, I used, when I was teaching a day long, which meant weekends, uh, day, the facility they used to rent, and it's since been torn down, but it was an elementary school. And that was really my favorite facility because the school had its own rules of kindness, which were these huge sheets of paper along the corridors. So whenever we took a break or we did walking meditation, we would all just like stand there and read the rules of kindness. And it said things like, um, don't hurt anyone on the inside or on the outside. And my very, very favorite rule of kindness was, everybody gets to play. Everybody gets to play. Not everybody's going to be my best friend. Not everyone's going to come home with me. But everybody gets to play. Everybody counts. Everybody matters. That's just fundamental. And that may not be hugely emotional. It may be, of course, but it may not be. And so I think that's a mistake to sort of consign the sensibility of loving kindness to a certain emotion. Because if you are doing loving kindness as a meditation practice, I've seen this over and over again for many years. You may not be sitting awash in a great wealth of emotion, but something's shifting inside of you. And the place it will reveal itself is in your life, which is, of course, where it counts. If you make a mistake, if things go awry, if you're meeting a stranger, um, if you've held all these ideas about someone and then you have the chance to really listen. That's where it'll show. And you, you realize, wow, I'm different. Even though I can't say, like, Thursday at 3 o'clock, you know, I had the great breakthrough experience, and it all opened up. OK, so another great myth around loving kindness is that it will weaken us. It'll have us be too passive. and kind of gooey and that it's sentimental and it's overwrought and it's um, whatever your image is of, of some hippie thing. Um, I have a friend who told my first book was called Loving Kindness and he said that he was so embarrassed. He used to read it on the subway and he was so embarrassed to be seen reading a book called Loving Kindness that he found a way to cover it, you know, so no one could see what he was reading. And I understand that. But I thought, at the time, I thought, wow, it's like pornography or something, you know? Like, what are we embarrassed about? Shouldn't we be embarrassed about reading, like, hatred, you know? Or, uh, but we do, I think, I think it's a big current conditioning. We think of something like love or loving kindness as as just being kind of gooey and uh, making us lose discernment and lose energy and lose power, which, of course, is completely untrue. It's a force. 
And if you are inspired by anybody, you know, and you read their story, um, it's something like that which gets people up in the morning, even if they're very ordinary looking lives and they're doing great, great things for someone. And it's, it's based on that sense of connection. To learn about the Tibet House member archives and upcoming Tibet House member trips with geographic expeditions, please visit tibethouse.us. Tashi Delek, and thanks for watching.